What's going on guys? Welcome back to Comic Island. My name is Joey and today we're going to be talking about some of the best comic series runs I've ever read in comic books. By the way, thank you to one of our Patreon, Jeremy, for sending in this request. It's a great idea. Don't know why I didn't think about it sooner. So what I've done is I've selected five of my favorite Marvel series runs versus five of my favorite DC comic book runs because this video can't be about just Marvel versus DC. So I'm going to be talking about some pretty heavily spoiler filled story arcs from Marvel and DC. So of course be aware of spoilers guys. If you haven't read the story yet and I've listened it, just turn off the video, come back to it later and check it out of course for a future time. Alright now with that being said, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Alrighty, this is the story of how a villain turns into a superhero through his trials and tribulations with the aid of the ghost of Peter Parker, of course. The excitement of this comic was enormous. Who knows how a story with Dr. Octopus in Spider-Man's body would do. I was crushed by his death, but the final scene where Doc Ock gets flooded with Parker's memories is a huge tearjerker. For those who don't know, or maybe you're just getting back into comics now, let's go through a little refresher. With his failing body, Doc Ock successfully transfers his subconscious into Spider-Man's body and vice versa. Parker dies in Doc Ock's body, but Otto, in Spider-Man's body, gets flooded with his upbringing and the concept of with great power comes with great responsibility. So he promises a dying Peter Parker that he will keep Parker's loved ones safe and continue the role of Spider-Man, but with Otto's advanced mind, he will become the superior Spider-Man. Enter the superior. Spider-Man series where Doc Ock with Spider-Man's resources as a member of the Avengers and with a fresh start begins a new spider army where he has agents working on spider island with spider mechs at his disposal. Spider-Bots patrol the city and Otto employs his ruthlessness to punish criminals going as far as to kill a villain with pedestrians watching. He aided the mighty Avengers when Thanos sent Proxima Midnight in to attack the city. He gave valuable life lessons to Wolverine just before Logan's death and he took part in the epic Spider-Verse event where all Spider-Man from around the world, the, sorry, the multiverse, came together to fend off the Inheritors. But at the end, the Goblin Nation's attack on the city became too much for Doc Ock in his own free will. He gives up control of the body back to Parker's growing subconscious. This story was just amazing and it gives so many dimensions to Otto Octavius. I definitely recommend checking this series out if you've got the time. Let's go back in time before we got a female Thor running around with Mjolnir. This is our Thor Odinson at his finest and without the need of his team members Iron Man and Captain America. Jason Aaron is a writer who knows Thor like the back of his hand and the writing is just so goddamn good. We explore the complexity of a thunder god from before he was worthy to present day all the way to when he becomes the Allfather. Tough questions are asked such as, are gods even worthy of being worshipped? And are they even the conventional gods that we know or are they just high powered aliens? The barrier between the two gets bent and even time itself as we see the son of Odin from three different timelines face off against a villain that will continue to shape the thunder god for years to come. Gore the God Butcher makes his first appearance and he doesn't make a ripple. He makes a crater in the Thor legacy that will ultimately lead to the Thunder God losing his mighty hammer making way for Jane Foster the Goddess of Thunder. This 25 part series reads like the Lord of the Rings. If there was to be any series run that I need for it to become a movie, hands down this is it. And of course I can't praise it without giving you some links to the complete story video we did a while back. The link will be in the description below. This massive Omega level event started with an Omega level mutant by the name of Legion aka the son of Charles Xavier going back in time to try to save his father by killing the villain known as Magneto. But at this time in the past, Xavier and Magneto are still friends so the professor jumps in the way and it takes that hit killing him in the process while saving Eric Lanshear. Legion disappears and a new timeline gets created where Professor Xavier never formed his X-Men to stop supervillains such as Apocalypse. So Apocalypse enslaves all of mankind but Magneto takes Xavier's spot as the leader of the X-Men. The fallout became one of the best Marvel comic events I have ever read. Back when we weren't filled with event after event after event, the age of apocalypse became the foundation of my love for comics and even though the universe has ceased to exist, we got characters from his timeline who bled into the main universe such as Sugar Man, Dark Beast, Nightcrawler and one of my favorite AOA characters of all time, Nate Grey aka X-Men. 
Now, continuing with the X-Men talk, let's talk more about a new exciting concept that Marvel introduced, which was to bring a whole new team into its universe. And by all new team, I mean the first original X-Men team from back in the 1960s. Hot off the heels of Avengers vs. X-Men and the whole Phoenix 5 fiasco, Beast, who has lost all hope for his friend Scott Summers, decides to abuse the time stream by bringing in his past self along with the other originals into the future to try to show the present day Scott Summers of how far he has fallen from Xavier's vision for himself and the X-Men. Now, this could have been a good novelty short series run by Brian Michael Bendis, but the idea of bringing in the original five into present day became so popular that the team is still here today. Introduced in 2013, we now have two volumes of the all-new X-Men, and they are still going strong. Cyclops discovers that he will grow up to become a mutant revolutionist and will die at the hands of the Terrigen poisoning. Jean Grey is seen as a messiah and is expected to fill the shoes of her older self, who has mastery over the cosmic entity known as the Phoenix Force. Iceman comes out that he is gay. Angel discovers that his future self went through so many changes such as becoming a horseman for Apocalypse and eventually loses his mind. And Beast has to carry the weight of knowing that his future self is responsible for their present day circumstance of being flung into the future without any way of getting home. This idea of the original 5 has now spawned 3 team issues in the all new X-Men 1 and 2 and the X-Men Blue. We even got 3 of the 5s getting their own self-titled series in Cyclops, Iceman and Jean Grey. Eventually they will have to go back and their minds will be wiped of all of their experiences in present day but for now this team is here to stay. If the X-Men are 2PG-13, then the X-Force is the story for you. Starting in 1981, the original team consisted of Cable leading a pack of aggressive mutants doing what the X-Men cannot, which is using overly aggressive forms of combat to get results, which does include killing. 2008 rolls around and it would be X-Men leader Cyclops who forms a new X-Force team composed of the X-Men's best trackers and killers and was designed to cross the lines that the X-Men could not. Led by Wolverine, this team was tasked to protect the newest mutant in the form of Hope Summers following the events of M-Day. But that's not the X-Force story I'm talking about. In 2010, with their mission complete, Wolverine promised Cyclops that the team would disband. He lied. A secret society has resurrected in Sabanur. No mutant wants a repeat of the Age of Apocalypse, so Wolverine forms his own secret X-Force team consisting of Archangel, Phantom Max, Deadpool, and Psylocke. With Warren Worthington's money backing the team up, they bring the fight to this secret cult, Clan Akaba, and ultimately gets a face-to-face -face with a resurrected apocalypse in the form of an innocent boy. This is the age-old question. If you had the opportunity to kill Adolf Hitler as an adolescent toddler, would you? The team gets divided when given the opportunity, but with distaste, their mission gets completed when Phantom Max pulls the trigger, killing the innocent mutant who could or could not grow up to be the villain apocalypse. But then, from this, Phantom X grows his own kid apocalypse in an artificial world. Evan Sabanur, a clone of the original, gets enrolled in the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. But what about X-Force? The Dark Angel Saga was one of the best storylines I've ever read due to its gore, grit, and dark tone taken right out of my favorite comic book team, the X-Men. We explore the relationship between Archangel and Psylocke, Angel's grasp on humanity, the return of the Four Horsemen, and Wolverine's struggle in leading his Black Ops team of killers. Then there's the comic relief Phantom X and Deadpool, two of the best assassins in the MCU. This is also where I started my love for the concept of Phantom X. He is a combination of techno-organic virus and a sentinel nanotechnology bred to be the perfect mutant hunting soldier but with a human look to not strike fear in the human populace. Codenamed Charlie Cluster 7, he found his own identity by the name of Jean-Philippe and is somewhat an unofficial member of the X-Men. Phantom X became an active member of Wolverine's Uncanny X-Force and in this series, we dive deeper into his background of how he was created from an artificial environment that can manipulate time created by the weapon plus program called the world there's so much more i want to talk about this awesome run so if you want to hear any more about it or any other series i mentioned in this video please let me know in the comments below and now we enter the world of the dceu uh nope no 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 not that ah <sighs> much better so here we go, let's start off the list with arguably the best group in the DC Universe, the Holy Trinity with their super friends. We got a reintroduction to Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern, and the Teen Titan that got a promotion, Victor Stone aka Cyborg. The founding members of the iconic Justice League gets a reboot caused by Barry Allen messing up badly by time traveling once again. 
And of course, we as readers benefit greatly from this. FYI, before you guys rip me to shreds about how it's actually not Barry Allen who messed things up and it's actually Dr. Manhattan who stole 10 years from everyone. Yes, I know, so I'll say this right now. But at the time of the new 52, we all believed that it was Barry Allen behind the Flashpoint event. Anyway, moving on. Sorry, I ramble like crazy sometimes. In this new world, the concept of high-powered metahumans are not a thing. The world continued relatively normal until Dark Side, Dark Seed, Dark Side invaded Earth, which brings out Batman and Green Lantern, followed by Superman, who attacks them both, thinking that they are alien invaders. Then Flash joins the group. Victor Stone gets taken into an inch of his life at Star Labs, so his father merges his body with apocalyptic technology, creating the hero we know as Cyborg. Aquaman arrives, bringing more tension to the group, but a good thing for Wonder Woman, who is on a peacekeeping mission from Themyscira. The team eventually defeats the invaders and their master Darkseid, but what follows is the discovery of metahumans in modern day. With heroes comes villains, and the Justice League fought them all up until the crime syndicate arrives from Earth 3, which leads into the Darkseid War. Oh my god, this is all too good, so yeah, you need to be reading how it all began for the Justice League and the DCU by picking up their flagship comic book run in DC's New 52, The Justice League. Superman's secret identity is the only Elseworlds story that made it onto my list. Yes, there are a ton of great Elseworlds stories such as Superman Red Sun, Kingdom Come, and even the current Batman White Knight series. But the reason I want to talk about this one, besides it being so good, is that this series doesn't get the recognition it deserves. Now, do you remember how awesome Superboy Prime was? He was the Clark Kent from a world where no superheroes exist except in comics. Then Superman visits him and he discovers that he is indeed a Superman who now has superpowers by leaving his reality behind. Of course, he turns out to be a murderous, powerful supervillain who killed many heroes including Superboy Connor Kent, but his origin was an awesome starting point. This leads us into Superman's Secret Identity, a four-part series that explores a boy who's named Clark Kent on purpose by his folks, thinking it would be clever for their boy to be named after someone famous. Well, he does get superpowers as a teen, much like the Superman we know. Clark has no clue how or why he got these powers. He isn't an alien and there are no such things as superheroes and supervillains. So he uses his powers for good, but in secret, while dealing with what a teen has to deal with, all the way till he joins the workforce, up until he becomes a middle-aged man. This is a low-key story that hits close to home if you are a Superman fan. Or if you enjoy Superman Prime, this story explores what would happen if Prime didn't go crazy and killed a ton of heroes. This also asks the question, what would a person in our real world do with powers such as Superman and how will he keep it a secret? Okay, I gotta mention one thing in this book that is a bit spoiler-ish. The government obviously knows of his existence and tries to track him down but he always is one step ahead. Every time Clark needed to do something heroic, he wears a Superman suit just in the chance that someone spots him. They will report that they see Superman. No respectable news outlet will run the story, except of course the tabloids and the dark web. This is such a great story that does well without the need for crazy and complex supervillains who enslaves the whole world. You gotta check this story out. Okay, I gotta confess something. I never liked Aquaman and have never read his comic before the New 52. Long hair fishhook Aquaman never intrigued me until he got a revamp in the New 52. I started reading Aquaman Volume 7 and holy cow, is he such an intriguing character. Born half man, half Atlantean, we explore Arthur Curry's obligation to the land and the ocean. We get a new history of his powerful trident, which connects other relics from Atlantis' past. And we dive deeper into characters that have so much depth, such as Volko, Ocean Master, and his love interest Mira. If you are intrigued by the concept of Atlantis in the real world like I am, then let that imagination go wild because Aquaman Volume 7 explores the legend and lore of Atlantis and Earth's history before modern day man discovered its existence. Fun fact, in the New 52 reboot, Atlantis was a land-dwelling civilization until it sank. When it sank, a small part of it broke off and was lost to Atlantis. This splintered off faction rebranded itself into the lost city of Zebel. Princess Mira was sent to Atlantis to kill the king so that her Zebel royal family can reclaim the throne, but of course she fell in love with him and aids him as his queen. I know this is a bit more love story, but their relationship just works. Then we got the Throne of Atlantis story arc that was so good. It spawned an animated series with Aquaman standing center stage. 
Superman Lois and Clark is the start of it all for fans like me who needs every story to be wrapped up in a bow and delivered. The Superman in this story is indeed the Superman from the pre-New 52, the one who died fighting Doomsday and the OG beast that never lost 10 years due to the Flashpoint event. This is also the Superman that survived the last world, got flung into the Convergence where he fought Telos and has now found himself in the New 52 where the Justice League had already formed and there is already a Superman 10 years his younger, running around fighting supervillains under the house of El Sigil. DC did such an excellent job of tying the loose end caused by the New 52 and Flashpoint by bringing in their arguably most popular superhero in their roster into the newest reboot. Then, how they solve the problem of what happens when the two Superman meets is just jaw-dropping awesome and of course, back in Convergence, we saw the birth of Superman's son Jonathan Kent. He is now in this world as a preteen and has become one of the best things that DC has done for us fans since bringing in the concept of the Court of Owls to the Batman world. So if you want to see how it all starts, check out Superman Lewis and Clark. Alrighty, we gotta end this with a bang because, as you may know, Batman is my favorite comic book character, so let's do this. Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo are the masterminds behind Batman Volume 2 as part of DC's new 52 reboot. After finishing this run, I will now read anything these two guys write and draw moving forward. I've never been more invested in any other hero than Batman, especially under Snyder's control. And then throw in Greg Capullo's drawing into the mix, <laughs> game over, take my money. This series is a story that is down in the dark alleys of Gotham City. You won't get a crazy gigantic space alien attacking the world, but rather, you get a dark and gritty detective story that lays out a complex mainframe of events that ties everything together, all orchestrated by the Court of Owls. Created by Snyder and Capullo, the Court of Owls is a secret organization formed during colonial times and has been the power and money behind the government in Gotham City. They have since gone global, now calling themselves the Parliament of Owls, but that's getting a bit ahead of ourselves. The Court of Owls have brought physical and psychological pain into Batman like I've rarely seen done before. Yes, Batman was tortured greatly in the DC Metal event, also done by Snyder and Capullo. But in Batman Volume 2, we get a first rule seed as we witness the Dark Knight struggle with what's real and what isn't. If the court isn't enough, Death of the Family brings us the Joker storyline where the crime prince torments Batman by hurting everyone around him from all of the Robins to Catwoman to Alfred and the list goes on. The story ends with Batman and Joker squaring off in Batman Endgame with only one conclusion. Joker is presumed dead and Batman lost his memory making way for Batmech to take his place. There's a lot going on here that I won't do justice unless you read the comic for yourself, so that concludes my list of top 10. Any one of these series will hit home runs, so I recommend checking them out. Alrighty guys, thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. Now, I've mentioned 10 awesome story arcs that I highly recommend to just anybody around. But if you want me to dive deeper into any of these story arcs, please let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this video and want to support us, I recommend checking out our Patreon page. The link will be in the description below. Thanks again, and if you enjoyed this video, Video, please like, subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time in another Comic Island video.